All right, well, uh, good afternoon. Um, our group, I'm Bennett Rainey, and our group is Performance Bonds for Data Creditor. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, the, the history of performance bonds, the, the role of the owner in the performance bond relationship, and, um, and I'll turn to Joseph now. Yeah, my name is Joseph Rigrox. I'll be discussing today the surety's role in the performance bond, and generally the risk that a surety undertakes and how they can limit that risk. I'm Evan Rossi, I'm with 3L here, and uh, I'll be discussing the subcontractor and the way that the subcontractor plays into this uh, project delivery system. And I'm Sarah Riedel, I'm at 2L here, and I will be talking about the contract contractor's risk and obligations in the surety relationship. So with performance bonds, the main thing about performance bonds are that performance bonds are used uh, in construction law. Um, con performance bonds, they decrease risk by providing a guarantee to the owner that if the contractor does not perform the work as, as promised in the contract, then another party, the surety, will guarantee that performance will be done and the owner will not have a loss if he has a performance bond. Uh, in turn, this increases production and just increases the overall uh, productivity, which is increases the economy. So performance bonds are extremely important you know, in our society because it's kind of like the glue that holds everything together um, because without the performance bonds, people will not be giving out uh, bids to contractors um, to, to, to build things. Uh, next slide. So the basic surety relationship, the, the three parties, um, there's, a, there's a, the owner, the principal, and the surety. The owner is the person who wants something done. So if an owner wants a house built, he'll hire a contractor to, to build a house, but the owner does not usually want to hire someone to build a house if you know, he, he, he gives the contractor X amount of money and the contractor either doesn't perform or breaches the contract um, or, I mean, a pipe explodes, anything that happens like that, uh, the, the surety is there to give the performance bond and guarantee the payment. So the surety comes in uh, to guarantee the owner that, you know, really he's not going to have that much risk um, if he has a performance bond. Next slide. And this is just a little YouTube video um, giving a little basics of uh, the performance bond. Performance and payment bonds are sometimes referred to as final bonds. Along with the bid bond, they are the most common type of bond needed by construction companies, but any company that enters into a contract may need them. The performance bond guarantees that a company will perform a contract, and the payment bond guarantees that a company will pay its subcontractors, suppliers, vendors, and laborers. Performance and payment bonds are generally required by law on most contracts with a governmental agency, whether federal, state, or local, and also on contracts with any kind of public funding. So private, uh, private uh, owners, or private contractors, private jobs, they do not require performance bond. Only publics do, but this presentation will be focusing on, on private contractors and not public. Um, and uh, unfortunately, our conversation with Mr. Chambers, it didn't turn out the best of quality, so we don't have that. But our, uh, our presentation does have excerpts from him and quotes, and uh, he gave us a lot of really helpful information that, that we use. And, and this is a quote from him. Um, he, he's, an, he's an attorney in Charlotte who's been working construction law for you know, 30, 30 years. Uh, a performance bond is a way to make sure that the deep pocket is on the, is on the hook to compete, to complete the construction project if the contractor defaults. Um, and uh, you can pull up the website. And so uh, the, the whole structure of our presentation is based on providing information to anyone who wants information about performance bonds. There was not one website we could find where it had this kind of information on it, where it was just a bunch of information on performance bonds because performance bonds is such a small little sector in um, you know in the realm of construction law so this website has got a lot of interactive uh, things about it and now I'll turn to Sarah okay so just to go over some of the features that we have on the website um, the mainframe is just some general information and introduction to performance bonds uh, we also have a page with a quiz and other learning materials. Um, 
under the learning tools tab and we have um, some general information about the risks and obligations of each party um, and sources that people can go for more information. Okay, so one of the easiest ways to talk about performance bonds is what one is and what one isn't. So a performance bond is the certificate evidencing a debt for 100% of the construction contract price. It's no more and no less than the price stated in the contract. Payment of the contract price is conditioned upon performance of the contract. <clears throat> if the contractor fails to fully perform, the obligee has no obligation to front the price. And the performance for a performance bond is fully defined by the plans and specifications that the parties have bargained and agreed upon in the contract. A performance bond is not an insurance policy. First, an insurance Anyways, I'll just start with one. Sorry. Um, a performance bond is not an insurance policy. An insurance policy has two parties, the insured and the insurer. The insurer will pay the insured for any loss sustained due to a um, predetermined set of circumstances. However, in the surety agreement, there are three parties, the obligee, the principal, and the surety. In the agreement, uh, extends safety credit in case performance is not completed, so it protects the owner by ensuring that performance will be completed. A performance bond is also not a guarantee. A guarantee relationship does have three parties, however the guarantor doesn't come into the, to the party relationship until after the contractor has already defaulted on performance. Um, in the guarantor relationship, the guarantor steps up and promises to the owner that he will fulfill the obligation. A surety, on the other hand, is jointly and severally liable with the contractor from the very beginning of the, of the surety relationship and liable for any default that the principal makes. So now I'll turn it back over to Bennett and he's going to talk about the history. So the, the slide that you see right now is a performance bond from 1708, and um, uh, it's a lot different than performance bonds today because performance bonds throughout history, they were a lot of things, and uh, the main thing that they were was a performance on an actual position that somebody held. Um, so this is a barrister, and it's a bond for, you know, it didn't, I mean, there's, the translation's online, and you can get that if you, if you go to our slide and click the link. But um, even the translator didn't, wasn't really 100% sure on what that meant. Um, but go to the next slide. But if you want to buy a bond, you can. You can go to eBay, and on eBay there are a lot of uh, relatively cheap bonds. Where, but in actuality, they're trying to sell you the stamp on the bond. But, um, but like the one from 1708, there are, a lot that, uh, there are a lot of old bonds. And this one, for instance, is to a governor, uh, and someone's uh, promising that he'll perform the role of justice, just, justice of the peace. And if he doesn't, then you know, this is a bond ensuring um, you know, it, the performance of that. No, next slide. Um, the slide you see right now is uh, the, the Currituck County Courthouse. This is not the original courthouse, but it's the one from 1723. And uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting story just because it's one of the oldest courthouses in North Carolina, if not the oldest. And um, Currituck County, they wanted to build a courthouse, so they contracted a man named Robert Payton to build a courthouse. So he, he, he got a performance bond, uh, went to build the courthouse, but he failed and he, he didn't perform. So the, um, the, the I can't, can't remember what they're called, the, the government of Currituck County took him to court to Bath County, North Carolina, and they sued him because you know failed performance, and so that's just a little interesting aside about um, you know kind of the history of performance bonds and uh, and okay. um, the penal amount is the amount that's secured by the bond. This is basically what the surety is potentially on the hook for if things don't go according to plan. Um, and as you might guess. It's based on the price of the underlying prime construction contract. 
So any changes would probably have to go through the surety and all the parties involved because obviously if the surety agrees to indemnify for a certain amount at the outset, it's going to want to know exactly what that price is. And any change from there on would have to be agreed to because it would be unfair to make a change order in the middle of the project delivery system and then expect the surety to indemnify for a price it never agreed to in the first place. So the penal amount is basically the maximum that a surety is ever going to have to pay. Okay, so the relationship with contract law is particularly important here. Um, and this is an area of construction law where it's very important to, kn to know the legal consequences of the owner's actions. So a prudent attorney will advise, will advise its clients on the ramifications of its actions. I mean, we can envision a situation where the owner is not satisfied with the general contractor's performance up to a certain point, and they, he would like to... Uh, fire him, get him off the job, and find someone else that can do it better. But really, I mean, in this situation, a material breach is, is uh, when the general contractor fails to provide substantial, the substantial performance of the contract. So if the owner just wants to fire the general contractor for, for a reason that's not sufficient enough that a court might find to be material, and then wants to hire its own contractor, thinking that the surety will indemnify and pay that contractor, and then a court later finds out that, or later determines that the original general contractor was an immaterial breach, then it can cause a problem. And in fact, the owner could even be on the hook twice, have to pay for the replacement general contractor and make the original general contractor whole. So and th this is an area where I think it would be very important for the, the lawyers to advise the, the client on just exactly what the actions, their actions can mean down the line. And now Bennett is going to go yeah. back and talk about the owner. So um, I'll be talking about the owner and his, his interest in the performance bond relationship. Uh, so first and foremost, the, the whole concept of a, of a performance bond, uh, rather than something that's in statute, because it's not really in a statute besides uh, the, the laws that are on public uh, construction projects, uh, it's, it's just a relationship between three or four people, and the owner is the head of that relationship. And so because he's the head of that relationship, he wants to ensure that his risk is very minimal, and he wants to decrease that risk as much as he can. And uh, the number one way, which Evan mentioned, to decrease that risk is the contract. Um, the, the contract and the, the performance bond are always construed together. Um, so just as, as important as a performance bond is to ensure that the, uh, the owner is guaranteed performance from the surety, it's just as important that the contract is just as specific on the terms of, of the um, actual project so that the performance bond can be enforced. Um, so the only person who can sue on a performance bond is the owner. Um, I mean, yeah. Next slide. Making a claim on the bond. Okay. Yeah. So we can go. We can go to the next one. Okay. The, the, and the, the the drawbacks are performance bonds. Um, there 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 aren't many drawbacks, but there are. And uh, some of the main ones are that the owner did not comply with the technical conditions of a bond to avoid paying the compensation. Another one is may have to settle for the least expensive remedy to the problem. And another one is needs to quantify the losses that might have been suffered when the contractor fails to perform. From these, you get that it's in the owner's best interest to always you know, account for every single penny that's spent, every risk or every loss that might happen as a result of any breach of contract. Um, because if he makes those, if he takes those precautions early on, and there is a breach, or he fires the contractor, he'll be in a bit better position to recover from the surety, because the surety is always at when, the, especially when the owner fires the um, or terminates the contractor, the surety is going to want to make sure that everything was followed to the T. So it'd be in the, the best interest of the owner to make sure that the contract. Is, is very specific in what's going to happen, and he follows that contract accordingly. Next slide. 
Like I mentioned before, there's really not really any statutory law uh, on on performance bonds. And um, when we talked to Mr. Chambers about it, you know, he mentioned the Miller Act, but again, we're focusing on private, so that's not really that applicable. Um, but all owners have a right to acquire a performance bond when they're doing a project, which they should. Um, it's very beneficial to have a performance bond, even if it's done in, in any sloppy way, just because it's got you got a little bit of of, uh, of, a, of a guarantee. Um, with that said, you don't want it to be sloppy. You want it to be as as clear cut and concise as it can be. Next slide. So this case, Haywood County Consolidated School System versus United States Fidelity and Guarantee Company, is a uh, is a pretty interesting case. A elementary school hired a um, contractor to repair some plumbing, and they they had a contract that said what you know what the terms were, and in the contract it required insurance. Then the pipes burst, and water exploded all over the gym, and it ruined their gym floor. And uh, so the contractor wanted to uh, have the have I mean the, the owner wanted to have the contractor pay for that. But the contractor had uh, gone bankrupt, so they looked to the surety, and the surety said, "Well, the contractor had insurance, liability insurance, so we shouldn't have to pay for the damages resulting from the um, the, the pipe bursting." And uh, the court didn't agree. The court said it didn't matter if if there was insurance because that didn't that didn't negate the fact that in the contract it said that um, the surety would. Be liable for any damages resulting from the the contractor, in which in this case, you know, that was a clear clear case that the contractor was at fault, and that's how the the floor was was ruined, and they got a brand new gym. Um, and so, what we learned from this case, next slide. What we learned from this case is that again, it's in the best interest of the owner to write that contract as best as he can, and and write it in a way that it fits the performance bond, and they go hand in hand. And when they, if he does that, he'll have multiple ways to in, to ensure that he'll he'll get paid if something goes wrong. Next, tips. and then uh, tip, tips for owners: uh, an owner should require a performance bond, include multiple provisions protecting his interests, record an account for losses and damages, record why the contract was terminated, and communicate early and frequently with the surety. If the owner follows all of these, then he's, he's pretty much doing as much as he can to ensure that he'll get payment in the result of a, of a failed performance on the contract. All right, so the party I'm representing today is the principal, also known as the contractor. Very simply put, the principal is the party obligated to perform on the surety agreement. If the contractor fails to perform, this is known as default. Um, the significance of default is that the surety's obligation to finish the performance of the contractor is triggered at default. Uh, and additionally, that is the only time when the owner can terminate the uh, contractual relationship. <clears throat> so negotiations are really important for the contractor because he is the party that carries the most risk in the surety performance bond agreement. So the best way for a contractor to negotiate uh, in his benefit is to state specific terms in the contract that will constitute material breach. And the fewer and the more specific that he can get those, the better off and the less risk that he's going to have. Uh, when we talk to Raleigh, at Chambers, he told us that the owner can only terminate the construction uh, agreement for material breach. And the most common issue that comes up that he sees in performance bonds is a court determining whether or not material breach had occurred. So it's crucial to determine what constitutes a material breach and what constitutes an immaterial breach. Uh, in a material breach, an example of this is if the contractor defaults or if he closes up shop. Those are the two most common scenarios that come up as material breach in cases. Material breach is to be considered in light of construction 
uh, industry uses and practices. So it's very context specific. It's not just generally what material breaches. It takes into account the context of construction relationships. Uh, and again, only material breach will trigger the surety's obligation to perform. Immaterial breach, on the other hand, <coughs> will arise if the con contractor fails uh, to do work to the exact plans or specifications in the contract. So for example, uh, he lays a faulty foundation and has to redo the work or uses a different material and has to take it out and replace it with the correct one. Uh, delay often comes up as confusing between material and immaterial breach. A delay is not a material breach, uh, generally speaking, um, and the owner is going to have to give notice and opportunity to cure the defect. However, a delay can become a material breach if the contract states that time is of the essence and that the project is a critical project. Uh, perhaps if a date uh, was stated in the contract as the end date for construction because the building needed to be used the next day. <clears throat> so a surety will look into the contractor's financial arrangements to determine how much liability the surety is willing to take on on the contract's contractor's behalf, and that is called the bonding capacity. Uh, Raleigh Chambers explained to us that it's very similar to a bank determining uh, lending capacity for one of its borrowers. And he also told us that the recent economic downturn has ha had a vast impact on the amount that sureties are willing to extend in bonding capacity. <clears throat> the surety relationship. Uh, the contractor and the surety are jointly and severally liable for the contractor's breach, and the owner can sue either the contractor or the surety, or both. The bottom line is that the contractor is not going to be able to escape the liability because the surety steps up to finish performance, uh, because the surety is going to use indemnification. <clears throat> indemnification is always implied in performance bonds. However, for the most part, the parties will make this express. The main reason that they make indemnification express is to expand the surety's rights under indemnification. For example, the surety might um, add uh, the ability to seek indemnification from third parties, like the contractor's subcontractor or his architects. The surety might also uh, require a security interest in the contractor's receivables, materials, and equipment and this would be an Article 9 security interest over personal property. <laughs> Additionally, the surety might also compel the contractor to place uh, collateral into the surety's reserve as an added security measure against defaults. Uh, so the case that best illustrates a way that a surety, or excuse me, that the contractor can defend against a surety is Davidson and Jones Incorporated the County of New Hanover. This is from the North Carolina Court of Appeals. In that case, the plaintiff contractor submitted a bid to, to build uh, a building for a company. The contractor hired defend the defendant architects uh, to assess the soil level on the property, the subsurface conditions, and to approve the foundation plans. After the architect gave the contractor the go-ahead, uh, and the contractor began laying the foundation, a nearby building was damaged heavily uh, as a result. So the owner stopped the construction and sued the contractor who denied liability. So the contractor filed a third party complaint against the architects. And the rule that comes out of this case, when the, um, when the architect breaches the contract with the contractor and it results in foreseeable injury that's economic, the architect can be held liable to the contractor for such injury. Uh, and it doesn't matter if the contractor has a contract between himself and the architect because this is based on negligence, uh, not contract law. So now Evan will come up and talk about subcontractor. Okay, well the subcontractor any subcontractor is pretty much going to be very important to almost any any construction project. Um, they are responsible for the specialty work. They come in and they can do the electrical work or the plumbing work. Types of things that the general contractor either doesn't have the skill or the tools to do or doesn't have the money to do it. Maybe it'll be 
less expensive to have a subcontractor come and do it because they specialize in all that. And um, just like a general contractor may use a performance bond to protect itself from the subcontractor default, I mean, in the other situation, it's the owner and the general contractor, and the general contractor is guaranteeing performance. In this situation, it's very similar. The subcontractor is guaranteeing its performance to the general contractor. And since the general contractor is the one with privity of contract with the owner, the general contractor will usually be the one that's on the hook for construction delays. So in order to protect itself from delaying the project from fault of the subcontractor, performance bonds give the general contractor more of an assurance that a, a subcontractor's delay isn't going to cause the general contractor to delay, in turn causing the general contractor to incur liability from the owner because of a material breach caused by a subcontractor. So, as, as Bennett was talking about earlier, performance bonds are really, I mean, they, they just give a lot of assurance and make, and make the machine that is a project delivery system run a lot more smoothly. And reciprocally, just as general contractor wants guaranteed performance, the subcontractor wants to get paid. Um, the payment bond assurance the subcontractor that if the general contractor does not pay the subcontractor for the work completed, it can obtain payment from the surety. Um, this, these are really important for any subcontractors. A lot of subcontractors are, they don't have the financial backing that a general contractor or owner would have. They have to pay their employees weekly and a lot of times they just don't have the, the support and they need to be guaranteed payment. And I mean, just overall, payment bonds will reduce the owner's risk. The owner doesn't want the subcontractors to threaten filing mechanics lien against the work that they provided to the general contractor because they're worried that they're not going to be paid by the general contractor. For example, the general contractor might have um, some financial instability. The subcontractor is in the middle of performance and is worrying that it's not going to get paid unless it files a mechanics lien on the work that it's done and thinks that the general contractor is going to go under or something. And so the subcontractor is going to want to have that assurance that even if the general contractor isn't able to pay, the subcontractor has that assurance that it'll be able to get paid from the surety. And it'll, it, since they're jointly and separately liable, this just makes the relationship a lot more amicable throughout the entire project delivery system. And the threat of a filing mechanics lien against the work that you've done, it, it causes an adversarial relationship between the general contractor and the subcontractor, and it's just not good for business, and it's something that you definitely want to avoid. Enforcing payment bonds. Okay, so a payment bond usually requires a general contractor to promptly make payment to subcontractors. So when the uh, subcontractor has done the last of its work, let's say it just finished the plumbing on a house, the, the standard contract will say that, the, that the, uh, the general contractor needs to pay the subcontractor within about 90 days of the last work performed. And a subcontractor with negotiating power, which would probably be rare in, this, in these cases, which is another disadvantage that the subcontractor has, they don't get to pick and choose, usually, who to work for. Usually subcontractors are brought in, you know, with not a lot of time, at, not a lot ahead of time, and, and employed quickly without a lot of notice. So they'll take pretty much anything. In, so there's not, there's not going to be a lot of negotiating power of the subcontractor. They would want the payment to, the prompt payment to be considered something like 20 days or 30 days, because so they could pay, you know, a lot of them have to pay their employees weekly. And it's, and they would much rather be able to feel that assurance that they're going to be able to pay their employees, especially because they're working with a lot less capital than any of the other parties in this relationship. And so the subcontractor is kind of a marginalized party and, and it's not, often they get the short end of the stick at when music stops. Good. Okay, so just a, a, some legal theory that goes into this. Um, Subcontractor suppliers and injured claimants may argue that they're intended third-party beneficiaries of the owner general contractor performance bond. So this is a this is arises out of the problem of there being no privity between the between the subcontractors and the owner. There's a gap there. The general contractor is the one that has the that has the contract with the owner. So clever lawyers will come in and try to and had successfully argued that the performance bond incorporates the bonded construction contract being the underlying prime construction contract, and the surety is liable for all, for all the terms and conditions of the contract, including the general contractor's obligation to pay subcontractors and suppliers at a furnished performance. And so courts will look at the bond language and see if there's a manifest an intent to benefit the third parties. So like I was saying, it's, I mean, just to explain it a little better, the contract between the owner and the general contractor says 
general contractor, part of this agreement is that you pay the subcontractors that have furnished work on, on this project. And if the general contractor doesn't pay, the subcontractor, having knowledge of this, of this language in the prime contract, say, well, you agreed to do this, you agreed to pay us for work that we've done, so how come you won't do it? And how come we can't assert our rights under your contract? And that's the, pro the problem of um, absence of privity here is proves to be very deadly for the subcontractor because without it, they're not able to assert liability. Um, and to, to, to prevent this from happening, this actually has been argued successfully, but to prevent it from happening, and the modern performance bonds pretty much get rid of this problem from the owner's perspective, and only the, only the named obligee has a right of action on the bond. And uh, we have a North Carolina case that, as well as many other cases, routinely uphold these provisions. Uh, um, West Durham Lumber Co. versus Aidenock Kedgley and Surety Co. is a North Carolina case from 1971. Um, the court held that a subcontractor can't recover under a general contractor's performance bond which provided the bond was given solely for, for the protection of the owner. So the explicit language here will pretty much guarantee that only one person will be able to sue on bond. Alternatively, the owner may also claim to be a third party beneficiary. If the contractor defaults, the owner may seek to enforce subcontractor performance bonds naming the contractor's obligee. But without an expressed or inferable intent to provide third party beneficiary protection to the owner, this claim will likely fail. To reserve the right to enforce subcontracts, the owner can draft the prime contract to require subcontract bonds to name the owner as dual obligee along with the general contractor. And this is another, this is another very important example of the bargaining power in, in this situation because the owner has the right to say, the pro, to, to make the prime contract say that it's able, it's a dual obligee and it can enforce other others' obligations. It, it can enforce obligations of performance bonds that wouldn't normally wouldn't normally include them but since the owner is pretty much running the show the owner wants those things to be included in the contract so this is like the opposite of the situation that the subcontractors in the subcontractor would like to be able to do this but the owner controls the language in the prime construction contract so this is where the owner pretty much dominates and it's kind of a, has led to unfortunate circumstances with the sub subcontractors not having the same bargaining rights but I guess that's just too bad Okay, so this is a video that we found that we thought, this guy does a really good job. He's from Canada, which is fine, and um, he does a really good job of explaining this. When a bonding company hears from you that the project may be in jeopardy, they'll work with you and help you come up with some informal solutions to address the issue and hopefully prevent a default. If you wish, the bonding company will arrange a meeting between you, themselves, and the contractor to address the specific issues and get that project back on track. So what happens when a contractor actually does default? Well, the first step in the default resolution process is investigation. When the surety receives a notice from you that the contractor is in default, the first thing they'll do is write you back immediately to acknowledge that notice. Then they'll begin to gather information and investigate the circumstances of that call of default. Now, in many cases, that investigation will take very little time, particularly in a circumstance where the contractor is insolvent or can't continue. In other cases, not so much, particularly in a case where the contractor is still solvent and is disputing the call of default. If you request it, a surety would be happy to provide you with periodic updates that outline the status of the investigation and provide you with their best estimate as to when that investigation will come to a close. Once the investigation is completed, if the surety then concludes that the contractor is in fact in default, well, that's when they kick it into high gear. The first thing they'll do is make sure that that work is protected from any damage or deterioration. Once they've done that, they'll work with you to map out the best method for bringing that half-completed job through to a successful conclusion. Now with that, they'll have two objectives in mind. First, minimize delays. Make sure the work can proceed as expeditiously as possible without any interruptions, because interruptions can be both costly and frustrating. Second, 
make sure that all labor and material payment bond claims are paid promptly. This will make sure that the subcontractors and suppliers stay on the job and ensure the continuity of that construction team, which will lead to a more expeditious completion. Once the contractor has been declared in default and the surety has responded under the bond, what can you do to help expedite the default resolution process? Well, I've got four suggestions. First, make sure you comply with the contract terms and the bond terms. This is critically important because without that, you may not have any protection under the bond. Make sure you've paid the contractor in accordance with the contract and you've given them proper notice and the bonding company proper notice of any of the issues as you're required to do under the contract. Secondly, communicate. Keep the bonding company informed of any issues as they arise and make sure you send out that default notice promptly. Third, cooperate. Make sure the bonding company has access to your knowledgeable staff and the relevant contract documents. That's critical in coming to terms with what the obligation is. And finally, keep your expectations realistic. A bonding company can help you solve the problems that arise from a contractor default, but they can't make those problems completely disappear. If a job is eight months behind, it's not really realistic to expect that a bonding company is going to be able to make up those eight months in just three weeks. The Surety Association of Canada website has a great deal of information on surety bonds, the claim process, and how bonds can help you. Visit us at www.suretycanada.com. Okay, so that's subcontractors, and Joseph's going to tell us about sureties. Thank you, Evan. So you just heard from Stephen Ness, he's the president of Surety Canada. He led some principles of performance bonds and a couple recommendations about how owners and the other parties should deal with a surety relationship. While he specializes in Canadian performance bonds, the same principles apply to performance bonds in the United States. So I'm going to tell you a little about the surety's role now, um, the risks that it undertakes a performance bond, and how it can seek to mitigate those risks or limit them. Keep in mind now that in the performance bond context, an insurance company is usually the surety. Sometimes it's a bank, but usually an insurance company. Again, this is not an insurance contract, though. So any obligation that the surety has under the performance bond is only conditional, meaning that the surety will not have to do anything or be under any obligation to perform until such time as events happen that trigger its duty. Whatever obligation the surety may have, it will be determined by both the terms of the contract between the owner and the contractor and the performance bond itself. So because of the language of these contracts is used to directly determine the scope of the surety's liability and obligations, it's crucial that the surety is aware of how a performance bond will be interpreted by a court if it gets to that level. So since the surety typically drafts these performance bonds as well, as per typical contract law, the performance bond will be construed against the surety in a court. So while the surety's obligations may vary depending on the specific bond used, um, institutes such as the American Institute of Architects have laid out these type of standard form performance bonds. For instance, the uh, American Institute of Architects A312 is one I'm discussing here today. And one of the advantages of having one of these type of standard form performance bonds is that it really just specifically lays out what the surety's obligations will be. And not only the surety, but lets the other parties know what exactly is going to happen. The A312 in itself specifically spells out uh, the scope and extent of what the surety will be liable for, what needs to happen in order for the surety's obligations to become due, the surety's options once its obligation is due, that is, it has different things that it can choose from in getting the contract completed, and also how long the surety is obligated for, which basically means how long the surety can be sued by the owner. So the surety and the contractor are jointly and severally liable, which means that the surety cannot be under any obligation until the contractor is. Basically, the surety and contractor go hand in hand with uh, their liability and obligations under the contract. So the agreement between the owner and the contractor is intertwined with the performance bond because of this. Now the A312 makes it clear with specific language that this agreement, known as a construction contract, 
is incorporated in the performance bond. So in this respect, the A312 indicates both the general principles of performance bonds and the nature of the necessary relationship between the, the contractor and the owner, as well as how they interplay with the surety. So we've included some specific copies of sections from Model A through 12 performance bond, so you can see just how the language is spelled out there. For instance, sections one and two, it this is what I was just talking about, the scope and extent of the surety's liability. Since there is joint several liability with the contractor, the surety is going to be liable for anything which a contractor might be liable for under that construction contract. However, some performance bonds don't exactly make it clear what the surety will be liable for. So this is a dangerous because, as I mentioned before, it will be construed against the surety in a court. So you want to go in knowing as clearly as you can what exactly your liability will be. So the A312 is especially useful here because it clearly spells out what exactly the surety is liable for. Other performance bonds don't exactly do this. They might, they might not. But uh, again, you want to know just what you're getting into before you go into court. So on, gen, in general, under the A through 12, the surety is liable for correcting any defective work that must be fixed after the project is completed or any damage that are caused by a delay in completing the project. More specifically, this includes the total cost of completing the contract, as well as any costs and legal fees or cost design professionals that are a result of the contractor's delay. The A312 also makes it clear that the surety will be liable for liquidated damages, but this is only so much as the construction contract includes a provision for liquidated damages. If there's no such provision, the surety will be liable for instead actual damages, which are caused by the, construct the contractor's delay or non-performance. And further, if the surety fails to act within a reasonable time when its performance becomes due, it itself may be held in default, and therefore the owner would be able to assert any remedies against it at that point in time, which it legally could. So the A through 12 again gives the surety a huge advantage here because you know exactly when you're going to have to perform and you are at less risk of not knowing and being in default. Here are the sections 5 through 8 pretty much spell out what I was just talking about in the A through 12. Okay. Now, triggers of surety's obligations. These are basically steps that have to happen in order for the surety to be under a legal obligation to perform. And these do vary depending on the specific performance bond, but again, an advantage of the A312 is you know exactly what must happen in order for the surety to be liable and have to do anything. So first of all, the owner can't be in default itself. The owner basically cannot have materially breached the contract. The owner also has to notify both the surety and the contractor. It's thinking about considering the contractor in default for whatever reason. And after this, the A312, this is an especially helpful provision. It requires that the owner um, initiates a conference between all three parties so that they can work out what the problems are and why the owner is trying to declare the contractor in default. So after that conference, if things aren't worked out, the owner has to formally declare the contractor in default and terminate its ability and its right to proceed on the project completely. Finally, the owner must pay the balance remaining on the contract price to either the surety or to a new contractor if they're brought on. And this is laid out in basically just section three, everything I just said. Now, surety has many options after its, its obligation is triggered. And these vary, again, depending on the specific performance bond and the terms of that bond. But uh, in general, they're pretty similar to the A through 12 lays out. The A through 12 gives you five main options, and some, as I'll talk about in a minute, are more advantageous than others. But just to go through them, first the surety can get the owner to agree to allow the contractor to continue performing and finish the contract. And this could be uh, specifically good for the surety if there's some reason why financing that particular contractor and not bringing someone in new or finishing the contract yourself is at your advantage. On the other hand, the surety can also opt to just take over the contract itself finish it out, but this is maybe one of the least uh, beneficial options. Might give you the most risk of the surety. I'll describe that in a minute as well. Surety can also give the owner a new contractor, get them to agree to new terms. This might entail a whole new construction contract and a new performance bond as well. If the surety does this option, it also needs to pay the, it also needs to pay uh, the original contractor for completed work, but the amount that 
the share needed to pay won't be extreme because, or sorry, I misspoke, pay the owner the amount for the wrong contract. But this amount won't be very high, it's only up to the penal sum as we talked about earlier. And if the surety just wants to wash its hands of the whole situation completely, the surety has the option of uh, buying back the performance bond from the owner by just paying it whatever, paying the owner whatever it may be liable for to him or her. And the last option is denying liability and basically doing nothing. And this option should be, even under the A312, should be exercised with extreme caution because if you end up being found liable, the excess costs of litigation just don't make sense. Um, the A312 does help someone in this instance because you know more if you are actually liable or not because it's clearly spelled out there. Again, sections four and five kind of lay this out in the contract. So the surety, some options are just simply better than others for the surety for a couple of reasons. Um, the first or third options, which is getting the original contractor to complete performance or tendering a new contractor may be the best because if the surety does this, its liability will ultimately be limited to the bond amount, the performance bond amount that is. And the owner will also be under an obligation to use uh, the balance on the contract price to mitigate whatever costs and damages there may be. Now the second option, which was to take over the contract itself, is not quite as good for the surety because the surety's liability won't be limited to the bond amount and could end up paying a lot more than it bargained for when it first entered into this agreement. But uh, even if the surety denies liability, typically, I and mean, this depends on different things, you know, if it's in good faith and other principles, but the amount it'll be liable for is usually typically limited to the bond amount as well. The duration of the surety's obligations, as I stated earlier, just generally deals with how long the surety can be held responsible or held in a court for its action on the performance bond. The A312 puts a two-year cap on this, and the two-year period starts when one of three things happens, whichever one's first. Either the contractor defaults, the contractor stops work on the project, or the surety fails to do its obligations when it's supposed to. But uh, the thing is that any contract or any performance bond that lays out the specific terms might not really matter because ultimately, whatever common law or statutory law applies in that jurisdiction will prevail. And the A312 itself recognizes this possibility by explicitly states that to the extent any term in the performance bond conflicts with the law of that jurisdiction, that law will win out and basically just rewrite that portion of the contract. This is all laid out in section 9 through 10. And uh, so t talking about these standard form contracts generally, the A312 is one of the most widely used and it's been around for a lot longer, but recently there's been some new players in the game. For instance, Consensus Stocks with their uh, Consensus Stocks 260 performance bond has been gaining some popularity and it's really similar to the A312, but there are some key differences. The, probably the biggest differences are first, there's no required conference between the owner, surety, and contractor before the owner declares a contractor in default. Now, we think the A312 is a big advantage here over the Consensus Stocks 260 because, again, that conference will help you know if the owner is doing what it should be and correctly putting the owner to the contractor in default. And it'll also allow you to perhaps work things out and the surety not need to be liable at all. But a big advantage of the Consensus Stocks 260, on the other hand, is less liability for the surety because the liability under the Consensus Stocks 260 is limited to only the completion of the contract. It doesn't have those delay damages like the A312 does. And again, there are some differences between the time that you can initiate a suit within, but these, the more important thing is to remember the surety needs to be aware of the law that might apply in the jurisdiction where the contract and performance bond are located. Now generally, the surety can actually sue the owner for damages in some situations, but this is usually only if the owner materially breaches the contract, um, but it has to be a very serious breach such that the contractor is justified in ending all of its performance and never coming back to the project. So the surety then would be excused from any liability and actually be able to recover some from the owner. But the owner, or the surety needs to be aware that there's a very thin line here because if the contractor decides that it's going to stop performing, it might itself be in material breach of the contract and be in default, and therefore lead to the surety being liable. So this is another area where the conference before 
the contractor is declared in default really helps to clear things up and make sure the parties don't make big mistakes that cost them a lot of money. And there's a, what I've been discussing so far about the surety is mostly related to more contractual type of principles, but there is a good tie in here with the general umbrella of debtor creditor relationships. Um, so keep in mind that when sureties enter these agreements, they do it because they want to get they don't do it to lose money. They're experienced in these type of situations. They do it because they know they can make money. So first of all, they'll get paid um, a premium just for signing on the performance bond. And then performance bond itself can actually take the place of uh, some lien rights or an article client security interest. Another big thing is that basically the surety wants to make sure that it is not going to lose any money. So it'll go to the contractor, or go to the parent company, that contractor, or the principal owner, whoever it may be, and tell them, they'll make them sign a personal guarantee that if they have to pay just one dime to the owner, that they will come and they will seize whatever property they need from that owner, the owner of the contractor, I should say, to pay their money back. So they'll take you know, your house, your vacation home, your car, your firstborn son, they'll take whatever they need in order to, to make sure they're making a good investment. You, know, you just have to realize that insurance companies or banks are routinely involved in these kind of things. They're in the business of making money and not losing it. So they're well aware of how they need to secure their obligations and their rights and make sure that they're not going to lose any money. Another thing that happens is performance bond can be secured by mortgages on you know, the owner's house or deeds to things like construction equipment. So, all right, you're not going to pay us, we're going to come take your tractor and sell it and then get our money back. So basically, the surety is usually not at much risk at all if they're smart about it. So that just goes to show that there is a good debtor-creditor principle that you can apply. So this pretty much concludes our presentation. We'd like to thank everyone for attending. Oh, we'd like to thank Stephen D. Ness from Surety Canada and Rosenberg and Parker Law Firm. Those are both the videos that we use in our presentation. Special thanks to Raleigh Chambers, who is the attorney, which we spoke to about performance bonds. He gave us a lot of clarity on the issue and helped us see how the relationships really worked out. So we hope to think we provide you with a, just a basic picture of how these relationships work and the interaction between the parties. We'd like to invite you to go to our website once again. It's performancebonds.yolasite.com. It's Y-O-L-A site.com. And come and take our quiz, see if we actually taught you a thing too. If you get bored, you can come and take our crossword puzzle. <laughs> and we, must, we also have, we have many more links that contain relevant information to performance bonds, whether it be law review articles, recent news stories, or what, what have you. So again, this will be up. You can access it at any time, and it should help you refresh your memory if uh, <laughs> your recollection of this presentation becomes distant. So on behalf of Evan, Sarah, and Bennett, I'd like to thank everybody once again. And this concludes our presentation.